So good afternoon. So for those of you who have not been to the Said Business School before, welcome to Said Business School and welcome to the University of Oxford. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are students from the university but not from the business school? Excellent. Welcome to Said. Um, I'm delighted this afternoon, Asya, because that's what I'm going to be doing all afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome this afternoon Bill Ackman, CEO of Pershing Square Capital which is a multi-billion dollar investment fund that takes long-term positions and investments in companies and then works with them, sometimes very publicly, to improve their performance. In addition to being one of the world's most renowned investors, Bill, is also, Bill and his wife are also substantial philanthropists. And we at Oxford are the beneficiaries of some of their, of their donations. In particular, uh, we are created a program called the One Plus One program here at the business school. Allow, that allows you to combine depth plus breadth. So to get the depth of a master's degree in one of the many topics around Oxford, get domain expertise and layer on top of that management skills. For those of you who are master's students around the university and you're thinking you might want to have a second year here and get your MBA, uh, the Pershing Square Foundation scholarships, graduate scholarship scheme actually will make that possible. Um, in addition to making it possible to come for students to come who had not yet been at Oxford, but apply for both years of the first year masters as well as ours um, in the MBA program. So we are grateful to Bill Ackman for that gift. But today is not about you know, Oxford and it's not about the one plus one program. It's a conversation about activism uh, in investing and activism in philanthropy. So to set the stage here, I think Bill, it was 1991 when you and I first met. To put this in context, you were mid 20s and I had just gotten I just started as a rookie professor two years before. Um, so Bill at the time was uh, trying to set up a, an interesting um, business which ultimately became Gotham Partners. Um, so for those of you who are students, as a 20-something as a year old, Bill set up his first hedge fund. Um, so why did you set up Gotham, Bill? And what did you learn from that experience? Uh, experience is making mistakes and learning from them. So that's what I learned. Um, no, so, so uh, the answer is um, I went to business school to learn how to be a good investor. And I learned the first rule of investing, which is you do your due diligence before you wire in your, your money. And uh, when I got to HBS, I actually opened the course catalog for the first time, and there wasn't a class on investing. Now, there were classes on accounting or classes on finance. So I decided I had to develop my own little self-study program. And I wanted to, uh, so I, I opened a Fidelity brokerage account. I said this, I had some money I'd made in the real estate brokerage business. This was my tuition uh, in the investment business. And it was about a year of tuition. And if I lost it, it was as if I had gone to business school for you know, two years but paid for three. So I, I figured it wasn't, it's like the, the inverse of the Oxford uh, one plus one program. But, um, and uh, you know, I, I, the first stock I bought went up. And then I said, okay, I found what I want to do. <laughs> a little more involved than that, but I, I uh, actually, my father, who's here, he he, he came with us. Uh, that's Dad over there in the corner. Uh, you can ask him whatever questions you want afterward. Um, he told me it was a really dumb idea to start an investment fund right out of business school, and he recommended that I go work for Michael Steinhardt or you know, George Soros or one of the other famous investors at the time. But I figured that I knew enough. You know, this is the the, the perils of youth, um, but. Uh, the answer is I was an entrepreneur and uh, I felt that I wanted to approach investing my own way as opposed to uh, learn from someone else. And it's one of the few things you can really learn on your own. You can learn investing by reading books, by reading annual reports, by having a, you can have a portfolio and invest $100 and you can, and you can learn the business, uh, unlike many other businesses which require a lot more. Uh, at least that's what I thought at the time. So you went far away from just investing in fidelity type you know, on, on, a, on a brokerage platform. Um, and Pershing Square has a particular form of investing, which some of our members of the audience may not understand, and it's sometimes called activist investing. So maybe you can just help, uh, you know, orient the audience about what exactly does Pershing Square Capital do? What's the general investment style, and, and why did you set it up that way? Um, so the vast majority of capital invested in the markets today is passive. So if you think of index funds or ETFs or even the big uh, kind of long-only institutions, the vast majority of that capital is by charter passive. Passive means you, you do your research, and in some cases you don't do the research. You sort of just blindly follow an index and you're, you're judged based on how closely you follow the index. 
If you think about investing 100 years ago, though, investing, you had Andrew Carnegie owning 20% of U.S. Steel, or you had J.P. Morgan as a, as a large owner of various companies over time. And in the old days of investing, an owner would act like an owner. So if they were unhappy with the performance of the business, they would replace the CEO. If they were unhappy with the board's judgment, they would make changes to the board. And as capitalism sort of democratized the investment process, and as any kid in business school can open a brokerage account, and as uh, inst you know, the, uh, the owners of many of these great uh, businesses over time you know, gave the shares away to a university or their heirs, and the ownership was dis you know, spread out, you know, the Sam Waltons of the world uh, kind of passed away, and the boards became to be managed by uh, professional owners. And so uh, what we do is we look for situations where a business has lost its way. Uh, where an otherwise great company with in, a, in a business that we would define as one that has significant barriers to entry, that Warren Buffett would describe as having a moat around it, a business that is simple, predictable, generates cash, and we can be confident we'll be here 50 years from now. A good example is we own a stake in Canadian Pacific, which is a, a railroad in Canada. Um, and if you think about the railroad business, you know, it's, not, it's a business where they're not going to build a new one across the street. And you can have, you know, absent some fairly dramatic changes in technology, you can be pretty comfortable that you know, goods will be shipped on rail for a very long time to come. So we, it's a business we can predict, we can think about it from a very long-term perspective, we can buy it at a price that's interesting. And in the case of CP, uh, this was the worst run railroad in North America. It had the lowest profit margins. It was trading at the lowest valuation relative to earnings and had a very unhappy shareholder base, but there was nothing they could do about it because they were inherently, again, the, the biggest investors tend to be very passive. And we saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was if you could replace the worst CEO in, in uh, the railroad industry with the best CEO in the railroad industry, a lot of money could be made. And we bought uh, first 12% of the stock and then another 2%, so about 14% of the stock. We recruited a guy named Hunter Harrison, who is uh, widely considered the best railroad executive of all time, you know, certainly in North America. He had retired at 65. He was 66 and a half. He had signed a two-year non-compete with his employer, and I think the biggest mistake they made was a two-year non-compete, because he was running the, uh, the other Canadian railroad, Canadian National. And uh, we hired him as a consultant. He helped us study the railroad, and he had plenty of fire in his belly. And we said, look, would you be interested in a day job? And he said, let me check with my wife. And she said, you know what? It's time to get you out of the house again. And, uh, my wife says that all the time. <laughs> And, and uh, we recruited him, and then we had to simply put him in place. Now, the problem was Canadian Pacific has one of the most sort of esteemed and illustrious boards in Canada, at least at the time, and it was the former head of the Royal Bank of Canada, the former CEO of Suncor Energy, the former head of the steel business. You know, it was a very, very important board, and um, they didn't like the idea that this idea was coming from outside the company, so they said no. Um, so we went to the shareholders, and we ran an election, you know, a proxy contest. We put up seven directors for uh, seven seats on a 13-seat board. Uh, and the shareholders voted with us 90% uh, of the time and voted against the other guys. Uh, and they got between 3 and 11% of the vote. We put our directors on. Uh, we did a review of the best CEOs in the world. Turns out the guy we identified was the best guy. Uh, we put him in a CEO. That was 16 months ago. Uh, and it's almost the most profitable railroad in North America after 16 months. That's how quick this guy goes to work. Stock's gone from 46 uh, to $151 a share. It's, you know, a little under $8 billion market cap to a $25 billion market cap. And that's kind of the perfect example. Now, it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> and I have a feeling that Peter might ask me about no, one of those cases. Me, <laughs> so I used to cold call Bill as a student, so this is going to be fun. Um, so it's very clear you've had notable successes. Bill's only own uh, estimation is 23, 2, and 1. Is that, did I get the numbers right? 24, 2, and 24, 1. 24, 2, and 1. 24 no. wins, uh, 2 not wins, 1 tie, something like that. Um, and Canadian Pacific is clearly a win. I think you just monetized 800 million. That's what I read in the paper. sold about a billion dollars or something. So, um, and then MBIA is another one where Bill was prescient about you know, the fact that the financial markets were going to. Well, the MBIA, which is a large insurance uh, uh, bond insurer, was in for a, a, a bad ride, and you figured that out. But there are some, the two and one, where I think what you've said in, in some of your recent things, where you've had some things that you've learned from those experiences. They might include, for example, J.C. Penney that's been in the news this summer. So what have you learned from the successes, and then maybe what have you learned from the ones that haven't been successes? You know, again, as I said at the beginning, experience is making mistakes and learning from mistakes. And uh, unfortunately, as students, you haven't made many mistakes yet. If you know, you've gotten to Oxford at this point in your career, the biggest risk is you probably haven't screwed up a lot. 
And so, you know, the risk of that is when data comes across your desk that's inconsistent with your being successful, you're less likely to pay attention to it than if you've made a few mistakes. So I encourage you to make some mistakes. Um, and uh, actually, I, I've made plenty of, over the course of my career, and I think I've been very successful uh, over time, but it's not been a straight line up. In fact, I had, if, if I were a stock, it would look something like this after business school, you know, and then, <laughs> and so the concern is whether this is coming, you know, <laughs> but, but so far, you know, we've, we've, you know, the overall trend has generally been positive, but, you know, there, there are certainly bumps along the way. And uh, JCPenney is a company uh, that we invested in that we knew on the way in was a much higher risk situation than a Canadian Pacific. So JCPenney, for those of you who are not familiar, is a 112-year-old American sort of iconic retailer that's certainly way past its prime. It probably peaked 25 or 30 years ago. Again, another example, you had James Cash Penny, who founded the company. He died, I think, in the early 70s. And there's a pretty good correlation between when the founder goes and when the company goes. Um, and part of that has to do with governance, which is a, a topic I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but the time we invested, JCPenney stock was down from 80 to about $20 a share. Uh, it was trading at about four times operating income. It had lots of assets lying around in the company that were non-core assets. It had a very bloated expense uh, base. And it was generating very little sales per square foot. It was a very underachieving retailer. And part of that is the brand had become somewhat tired. And they had gone to a very highly discount-oriented model where they'd <coughs> mark a address at $40 and they wouldn't sell any of that price. And a week later, they'd mark it to 20 And they probably wouldn't sell many at that price. And then they would send you a coupon where you got $10 off and then start to sell a few. And then if you used your credit card, you got $4 off. And if you bought this moment, you get another $5 off. And eventually it was, you know, 8 bucks or whatever. And they sell a lot of them at that price. And, um, but this was undifferentiated merchandise. And the thesis was um, this company has actually still a brand, well, faded, uh, restorable. And uh, because they were created over the last 112 years, they actually own about 112 million square feet of some of the best real estate in the shopping mall, in the shopping malls, uh, in the shopping uh, real estate uh, industry. But they own or have very long-term leaseholds at very low rents. And we said, look, this is a great platform to rebuild the company. And we bought a 16% stake in the company. Uh, we <coughs> I was invited to join the board. I, I joined the board with uh, a, a friend who bought 10% uh, along with us. So we owned together 26% of the company. We both joined the board. We were two of 11 directors. Um, and the CEO was 64. Uh, and uh, the board was very much focused on succession, as any board should be generally, but particularly when their CEO is in his mid-60s. And uh, we helped the board with succession. And there was a candidate uh, that kept surfacing as the best guy in retail. And this guy's name is Ron Johnson. And he had an ideal background. He didn't go to the Oxford Business School, but he, or Saeed, he went to Harvard Business School. Uh, and he graduated, he went to work for Mervyn's. His dream in life was to reinvent the department store. And Mervyn's was kind of a dying department store. It was acquired by Target. So he spent a few years at Mervyn's. He spent 10 or 11 years at Target, which is probably the best run US discount department store. And then he was hired by Steve Jobs uh, to build the Apple store from a blank sheet of paper. And he did an absolutely incredible job. And we said, look, you couldn't ask for a better background to do what we're trying to do here, reinvent the department store, um, combine the Apple customer store experience with uh, you know, kind of some of the target uh, brand excellence and cost management. And the problem was recruiting him. He was very happy living in you know, Atherton, California. He had uh, three, four hundred million dollars of restricted stock in Apple, a hundred million of which he was gonna lose if he left. And he had kids who were in, you know, 13, 15 years old in the middle of their, you know, at a time when parents don't like to move. But I managed to convince him to take the job. And uh, he walked away from a hundred million restricted stock uh, we gave him $50 million to make up for it, but he still took a loss when he took the job. And then he invested $50 million in seven-year options that he bought with his own money that he couldn't sell for six years. So I thought this is the absolute perfect thing. We have the best guy. We've got a great platform at a really cheap price. We have the perfect alignment of incentives. And I thought, it's done. But it didn't work. But it didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, and so Ron got started in November of uh, 2011. And he proceeded to make a series of changes, um, many of them very favorable. Among them, he took a very hard look at the cost structure and found about a billion dollars that he could take out of the cost structure of the business. We took a hard look at all the non-core assets, and we monetized about $600 million of the non-core assets. So far, so good. And then he launched a business plan to convert the JCPenney store into basically a mini shopping mall, uh, a Selfridges-type model where there were a series of uh, brands, each of which would have their own kind of presence in the store. And then you'd have a consolidated checkout you know, with a wireless experience and sort of this Apple-like 
uh, customer service experience, and he sold this idea to brands that heretofore wouldn't be willing to go into JCPenney, and the guy's very charismatic, it was a great idea. And he had a whole bunch of brands that he got from around the world who were excited about opening up inside JCPenney, and he went to work. But he made one very significant strategic <coughs> mistake. This whole notion of what he almost called fraudulent pricing, this overpricing an item and then marking it down and marking it down in coupons. He said, look, this is a waste of time. Let's just mark it at the price. The consumer knows the fair price. Because when you looked at those $40 dresses and $40 shirts, they all sold it for something like $12.30 on average, and very little sold at any other price. He said, let's just mark it at 12 bucks. The consumer understands value. We can save a huge amount of, you know, the company had spent an enormous amount of man hours actually changing signs. If you think about how often they're constantly repricing and reticketing and changing signs, it made the stores look really cluttered. And, you know, it sounded like a brilliant idea. And Apple, the Apple experience was not about testing. So instead of trying this out in one or two stores or in a region, he rolled it out across the country. And it failed. And the customer who had become accustomed to getting coupons in their Sunday circular, all of a sudden the coupons weren't there, and so they decided not to come. And we lost about a third of our customers after about 12 months. And the great thing about a retail business, if you get it right, is this business has enormous operating leverage, right? Because you've got a f substantial fixed cost base, but once you start generating additional sales, it almost all drops to the, a lot of it drops to the bottom line. Well, the you know, only problem with leverage, as you learn in business school, is it works in reverse. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, the company was losing huge amounts of money after having spent a ton of money on capital rebuilding and uh, redesigning these stores. And we found ourselves in a turnaround 15 months after he was hired. And we had to replace him. And the lesson? There are many. Um, so number one, this was what I call an extreme makeover of a company. And when you do an extreme makeover, it requires perfect board alignment uh, and backing for the CEO. And uh, we didn't have that. Number one, we were one of 11 directors on the board. And there was still a, uh, while it had it worked perfectly from the beginning, there wouldn't have been a problem. As things got dicier, there was a divergence of opinion on the board of what to do and when to do it and who to hire. So I think that's one interesting lesson. I don't think I'll ever go on a board and be one of 11 anymore. I like going on with a mandate like in Canadian Pacific. Um, two, you know, I think Ron is an incredible talent, but I don't think, like the students in the room, uh, he'd ever made a mistake before. And I think it was, as the data kept coming back, you know, Ron still had a lot of confidence it was going to work, and you've got to back your CEO and give, and, and give, him, and give him rope. And I think uh, Ron will be, and I think he'd say this today, he'll be a much better CEO th the next time, because having had a big negative experience like this. I think third, retail is one of the businesses where you can really test, right? You can take a region, you can take a store, uh, and you can try things out and rejigger them and test them. And I think, uh, you know, the Apple experience, Steve Jobs was all about the customer doesn't know what he or she wants. I know what the customer wants. And, it, and Steve Jobs, you know, got it right. I think in retail, you know, there's a kind of a saying, the customer knows what he or she wants. And I think you really have to listen to that. Um, so while I actually, I still love the vision for JCPenney, I think it was right. I think the execution was difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, to do something like that, and also in the public domain, right, this is a major change, and the company was constantly being harassed by the press, and Ron was attacked. I think it makes it difficult to make decisions in that kind of a public context. So there's, there's a lot, I could use up the rest of the lecture here okay. with, with that other but, ideas. You know, what's amazing for the audience is this, is this is on the bad side of the ledger, and Bill, you know, you being so frank about what worked and what didn't work, um, I think this is how we learn at a business school, because even though you may not have failed yet, you know, we, us old guys typically have, and uh, we have an opportunity to do that. Actually, on failure, just for a second, I don't know, there are very few people, uh, you look at the most successful people in the world, I, I know very few of them that haven't had a major failure. Mm -hmm. You know, if you read through the, uh, they're not the financially most successful people, if you look, read through the Forbes billionaire list and you read their stories, you know, they've had failed businesses and they've lost everything and they've mm -hmm. hung on the, you know, they've almost died holding on to the ledge, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the, uh, the guy on CBS and uh, oh, yeah. Sumner, Fire, uh, yes. Sumner Redstone. The Redstone yeah. um, so there are lots of examples of people who had huge adversity. And I think it's how you deal with adversity that determines your ultimate success as opposed to how you deal with success that determines your ultimate success. So, so that's one of the things I've learned. Good lesson. From J.C. Penney and otherwise. Okay. <laughs> so you're an investor, Bill, but you know, once you get on a board, you're also, you know, you're a board member inside Pershing Square, you are a, a kind of a manager and leader. So how do you describe your personal management style, your leadership style? Not necessarily as an investor, mm -hmm. but when you're actually leading things inside or around. Okay, so 
Uh, the only leadership role I have in a public company today is I'm chairman of the board of a company called the Howard Hughes Corporation. And uh, there I'm a non-executive chair, uh, and I work, uh, I have an outstanding CEO, a guy by the name of David Weinreb, who runs the company, and he's outstanding. His, and uh, the, the key things I did there were, one, I recruited him, two, I gave him, uh, we set up a, a, an incentive arrangement with him. I, you know, he was the first guy I did one of these, you know, buy seven-year warrant, you can't sell for six years. We put up his own money. In his case, he invested 15 million, it's worth 150 million three years later. So in his case, it seems to have worked better than in the JCPenney case. Although I would say in the JCPenney case, it worked well too for a second in that Ron did, he lost his $50 million. So he did, you know, the alignment was there. Um, but that doesn't guarantee you an outcome. But key, you know, set up the incentive structure that, so that the management issues are aligned with yours. And then just be direct. You know, my approach in business, in my personal life, in a management role is extreme candor. And I think that um, if you live that way, um, you know, you'll run the risk of offending various people over time, um, but you'll have much better relationships because, um, you know, if you tell people the truth, first of all, it's not typical. You know, a lot of people uh, in the interest of politeness or fear of confrontation or it's just uncomfortable, don't speak the truth. And that goes for pe people on boards. Mm -hmm. You know, you, there's lots of examples of super talented people sitting around the room as an institution is failing. Think of all the, mm -hmm. the banks during the crisis where people were not willing to confront the CEO. So I'm willing to confront the CEO, uh, and, uh, but I'm completely candid with him about his successes and his failures. Um, and uh, it's, but I give him, you know, I don't step on his, I don't run the company. I'm not involved day to day at all. I trust his judgment. It's a bit of a trust but verify uh, type relationship and it's worked very well. So that's the, uh, my only public leadership role. I am CEO of Pershing Square. It's a much easier business to run than a, a normal company because we've got uh, only 56 employees. And here the key is, uh, the key to successful leadership is one, hiring the right people. Uh, I have the benefit of not inheriting anyone because I hired everyone in the company. I interview every receptionist, I interview every secretary, I interview every investment person. Um, and so I get to pick ultimately everyone that I work with and that helps leadership a lot. Because if you hire, the, the key behind leadership, if you hire super talented people, you don't need to do that much leadership because they're <laughs> gonna do the right thing. Second thing is setting up the incentives correctly. So in Pershing Square, everyone is incentivized by how the overall firm does, which I think is a good dynamic because it creates uh, uh, teamwork. Uh, I follow the same extreme uh, candor uh, approach in uh, evaluation, evaluating people. Um, and I care about everyone I work with uh, as I do a, a family members. And so we look out for each other and if someone's going through a difficult health issue or personal issue, uh, financial issue or, uh, you know, I have the benefit of having a lot of relationships and whether it's the medical community or in the uh, business community or, or in the political community and so we, we help our people and uh, we don't tolerate uh, insincerity. Uh, I, you know, people are encouraged to admit their mistakes immediately uh, before they figure out a solution to the problem. So my, when, when I hired my CFO um, in the first year of working with him, he would approach me with a mistake he had made after he had figured out how to solve the problem. And I would get angry with him every time. I said, no, no, I don't want to hear about the mistake after you figured out the solution. I want to ha hear the mistake now and then we can work together on solving the problem. So I think if you have an organization where people very quickly admit mistakes um, and where you're candid with them and they're not punished for making a mistake, um, that is a very good uh, if, uh, dynamic. And uh, it's worked very well. We have almost no turnover even in the reception desk at Persian Square, um, and and that's worked. Uh, it's been a good model. Right. And so I don't do that much leadership, uh, other than uh, I, I guess on the leadership side, I think you have to, uh, you know, you have to set an example uh, in terms of the way you live, in terms of the way you behave, because that affects how other people uh, will watch you. So my other key success factor for being a leader in the 21st century, in the era of everyone having a video camera on their cell phone is assume that everything you're doing is being videoed and recorded uh, at all times. And that will, you know, and consider that the video ends up as a top video on, on YouTube and then adjust your behavior accordingly. <laughs> so. Fair. <laughs> you are being videoed, by the way. Um, so if I'm correct, all or almost all of your investments have been in North America. Um, but I note that you are creating a new fund that will be listed on the London Stock Exchange with an eye to raising money from the global capital markets. 
Any observations on opportunities for your kind of investing outside of the Americas? Sure. I think there are a lot of opportunities for shareholder activists um, in markets outside the United States. Uh, the reason why we focus on the U.S. is because there's a lot to do. It's close to home. I speak the language. Mm -hmm. I understand the law. We're very well known in the United States. Uh, I know every CEO in America knows who I am. So if I pick up the phone and call, I'm going to get a return uh, phone call. Um, and we do so few things a year. You know, if we do three things a year, that's kind of a big year for us. So we, we have a lot of wood to chop before we need to go far. And as much as it's fun to come to Europe, I'd rather come here on vacation than, than, than to come here for a proxy contest. And if you have a problem, by the way, so JCPenney was a problem, I spent a lot of time in Texas, but Texas is a lot closer than you know, Japan or, or uh, you know, Italy and, and, and so on. Maybe so, not culturally. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, all of that said, um, and I think the US uh, shareholder activism has become very uh, well known and understood, and directors are very responsive to shareholder activists. Whereas I think uh, Europe is probably 10 years behind in terms of the degree of shareholder activism and how directors respond and precedent and so on. So I think it's harder here, um, but I think it's, it's, an it's gonna happen because I think passive investment management as a long-term strategy is not a great long-term strategy other than in, in bull markets. And so I think the demand for returns to meet pensioners' obligations will make shareholders inherently more proactive and unaccepting of underperformance. So Bill was interviewed on Charlie Rose recently, and I watched it in preparation for tonight. Um, and one of the questions that Charlie Rose asked you was, if you weren't an investor, what would you do? And after a little bit of throat clearing, you said, you know, I always thought about government. Um, so suppose that we follow up on that Charlie Rose question, uh, and I can look at some of the, what you've done is in some sense uh, to recast it as almost like a private regulator, you know, what you did with MBIA and Herbalife, which we'll get to in a second. You know, I really see you as a private regulator, but suppose you were in government. What part of government would you be in and what would you be your mandate? Uh, so not sure I'm ready to go into government. A lot of, a lot of downside associated with that. Um, but. Uh, look, there will come a point in time, uh, hopefully there will not come a point in time, I mean, it's a better way to say it, where I'll be so, f where I won't be frustrated with how our government is run that I feel I need to do something about it. But I, I think that the, the business community globally has stepped out of government uh, to too great an extent. And I think the consequences, I mean, so I think the typical sort of point of view in the United States has always been, well, you know, our government's not th that particularly well run. But, you know, it's such a great country that it doesn't really matter. Uh, and I think it's increasingly matter, increasingly matters. So if you think about, uh, you know, the United States as a business, right, we've gone from being very conservatively financed to approaching uh, over leverage. Uh, we, the, the governance structure is inherently dysfunctional in terms of our ability to make decisions about even meeting our contractual obligations to our bondholders. I mean, the, the fact that we've had, we had a uh, debt ceiling crisis only a couple weeks ago is, is, is a perfect example. Uh, that the implement, you know, that we imagine launching a business ap appealing to like 100 million new customers and the website going down the first day and not working for like a month. Okay, imagine if that happened in the private sector. You know, would, would anyone keep their job that worked for that business? I mean, I think, so I think that you know, the, our government has not shown itself particularly uh, effective at things business. And I think the running of the country, a huge part of that is, is you, know, the United, you know, the president is the CEO of America. And uh, he's responsible ultimately for how the website works. It's like Jeff Bezos. If the website goes down, you don't blame the CTO. You blame Jeff Bezos. Uh, and um, I think that, uh, you know, I, what I like about what I do is we can work to make business more effective. and. At some point, uh, it'll be time for someone to take my spot. And the question is whether I can be helpful uh, uh, on government. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't know what the right role would be. But it's tough. Having been, you know, the benefit of where I am now is the buck stops with me. And the question is whether I want to work for someone else. And so I guess I either have to be CEO or maybe I have to find something else to do. OK. <laughs> We're waiting for the post of CEO USA here. So that's coming. Um, they should have that post. They should be the president. And there should be the guy who runs the business yeah. of the country. Or chief operating officer. Seriously. So we'll, we'll suggest that next time. The president time can shake hands. He can attend funerals. OK. <laughs> there you go. Someone should run the country. Yeah. I would be remiss if we spent this time together and we didn't talk a little about Herbalife. Herbalife. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, and Bill was going to explain more, this is a direct selling scheme, um, which the day I came to see you in New York, you were about to, or that day you were launched your PhD length report on all the various problems with Herbalife. You then had a substantial short position for those of you who don't know finance. So that's basically setting a position such that you benefit if the stock goes down. Um, a very public and nasty battle with Carl Icahn. Um, and in the last few days, I see restructuring your position from shorts into put options. Forget about that for those of you who don't worry about finance. Um, and one element of this deal, which was extraordinarily novel, I mean, the whole thing was novel, was your announcement that you would donate your profits from the trade to charity. Um, can you explain what's going on at Herbalife? And in particular, maybe focus on that last piece, which will be a bridge to some things on philanthropy. You know, what were you trying to accomplish? And, and what was this announcement about donating profits from, tr from the trade to charity? And why did you do that? Okay, so as you mentioned uh, earlier, so about uh, 11 years ago, uh, I came out with a white paper called Is MBIA AAA? Where I questioned the AAA rating of a company called MBIA. I disclosed on page one of that report that I had shorted the stock and bought CDS, a kind of an uh, insurance product betting on the company's uh, credit deterioration, and uh, caused a bit of a stir with this paper. Uh, the company did not like the paper, uh, and they, as the largest guarantor of New York State and city bonds, decided they wanted to get back at me, and they called up Elliot Spitzer, who was the then presiding attorney general in New York, and said, look, there's an evil guy saying that we don't deserve our AAA rating, and you know, Moody's and S&P say we're AAA, who's this guy? And uh, Moody's and S&P would later lose some credibility after this. But the, this was a 150 to 1 levered company. Uh, it was guaranteeing a, a whole sort of very risky subprime CDO, CDO squared, CDO cube, and so on and so forth. And it was insolvent uh, based on the exposures. And a, a good analyst digging deeply could determine that. Um, and I came public with this. And I was largely ignored. And I kept at it because I'm a persistent guy. And I made a series of presentations. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I remember some of the names of them. But anyway, so I made a series of presentations, and no one was really paying attention. The stock was 73. The, the credit, the insurance just kept getting cheaper and cheaper, meaning no one believed that we were right. And one day at my last presentation, I said, oh, by the way, no one ever believes me on this one. They say, well, you're short, so how can we believe you? Because you're going to profit if it declines. So I said at, at a conference, I said, okay, I hereby commit to give away 100% of any personal profit I make from this investment. That, was, that day was the high for the stock. And it went from 73 to $3 a share. And the credit protection went from 13 basis points to 2,500. We made a billion, six or $700 million. I personally made $150 million. And the $150 million uh, seeded uh, was really the, maybe the second or third uh, grant, but the big grant that created the Pershing Square Foundation. So the Oxford uh, program is an indirect beneficiary of the failure of MBIA. Um, <laughs> the failure of the financial system actually has a yeah. silver lining. I love that. So uh, the problem with short selling is it's something that, even though it's perfectly legal, it's something that people have a degree of discomfort with. You know, it's almost perceived as un-American to bet against a company. And we, by the way, only do it in very rare circumstances, and generally only when we believe when it's good for America or good for the world for the company to disappear. And so uh, in, th in this case, you had a company that was assuming more and more credit risk and had only a tiny capital. They had $5 billion of capital and a trillion dollars worth of obligations they were guaranteeing. And because they were AAA rated, uh, banks and other institutions were not holding capital against these exposures because regulators say if it's AAA rated, you don't need to hold capital. So this was creating, in fact, in my testimony to the SEC, and if you actually, there's a book called Confidence Game, which is about my battle with the company. And if you go to the Confidence Game website, all of my transcripts of testimony to the SEC and the Attorney General, actually online, you can read them. And in there, and this is early 2003 time frame, I said, there's going to be a credit crisis if you don't shut this company down. No one, no one paid attention. Anyway, um, so uh, I came across a company. Anyway, so the, I think the giving away of the, the, the profits uh, made people say, look, maybe this guy actually believes what he's saying. People paid a little more attention, and, and I think that helped. Um, and it's probably going to give the money away anyway, so. Uh, it's easy to give away when you don't have it. After you receive the 150 million, then it's really, oh, OK. <laughs> um, so the second time round of consequence is a company called Herbalife. And uh, Herbalife is a company that's reportedly in the nutrition business. They sell protein powder shakes. They sell vitamins. They sell uh, uh, herbal tea. Uh, they sell uh, some nitric acid type uh, things that supposedly are good for your heart. These are all commodity products. Uh, they're made by five, six, ten different manufacturers. You can buy them at your local pharmacy. You can buy them at your local GNC if they have that here. You can buy them at your local uh, supermarket. 
But the price you pay at your supermarket is about a quarter to a third of the price you pay for the Herbalife products. So who in their right mind would buy this overpriced stuff? Uh, and uh, the Herbalife's number one product is called Formula One. You know, no one's ever heard of Formula One other than the race. Uh, and it competes with a product called SlimFast, which I guess many people in the room may have heard of. It's a product made by Unilever. SlimFast sells 100 million, 150 million a year. Herbalife ostensibly sells 2 billion of the same product. Now, how is it that SlimFast sales have been coming down every year and the Herbalife product has been growing? It's sold what the, by what they call a direct selling model. And the way that works is, your name is? Marianne. Marianne. So Marianne comes to me and she says, Bill, don't I look terrific? I've been losing weight. I've got this product I've been using. And I said, wow, you look fantastic. Um, and she said, would you like to try it? I said, sure. A friend approaches me you know, and says, hey. And so you try it. And then uh, she says, hey, would you like to make a little money on the side? In, a, in this economy, who wouldn't want to make a little money on the side? And she convinces me to become an Herbalife distributor. And she tells me that if I sign up five friends, and each of them sign up five friends, and each of them sign up five friends, pretty soon I'll be collecting royalties, and I can retire rich. Or if I'm less ambitious, I can make some little money on the side. And as a unsophisticated, unemployed, uh, low-income person, which is the target audience uh, for Herbalife, this kind of pitch from someone I trust sounds appealing. And the unfortunate thing is that something in order of 99% of the people lose money. Uh, there are about 50 that make 5 or 10 million a year. There are about 1,000 that make a few hundred thousand a year. And the other 3.6 million lose, you know, anywhere between $300 and three, eight, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And it's really a money transfer scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. It's like a chain letter. When you got one when you were a kid, you know, send a dime to the following uh, 11 people on the mailing list, and then in three weeks you'll have $1,000. Um, if you think about what a Ponzi scheme is, it's a money transfer scheme without a product. A pyramid scheme is a money transfer scheme with a product. And they do smart things like put the Herbalife uh, logo on uh, football jerseys of famous soccer stars, and they back various teams. That's very appealing to the Hispanic community, which is actually the target audience that they've been very successful with. Um, now, unfortunately, or fortunately, pyramid schemes are illegal. Um, now, here's a pyramid scheme. It's got a $7 billion plus market cap. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. It's been in existence for 33 years. How is it possible? that this company could be a pyramid scheme? The answer is, it is. And in fact, they've used their tenure as a public company and the New York Stock Exchange listing and the imprimatur of a Nobel, a Nobel laureate they paid $15 million to to serve as representatives of the company and lax regulatory regime in the US to allow this pyramid scheme to grow to an enormous size. And the problem with pyramid schemes is they run out of victims and they inevitably com collapse. And uh, the, I can actually prove to the audience very quickly that this is a pyramid scheme, and I'll, I'll do that by asking you a question. So Herbalife entered the UK in 1983, 30 years ago, okay? Um, Pepsi has been in the UK for a longer period of time, but after 30 years, Pepsi had a good quarter last quarter, and they grew their sales at 3% in the UK. What do you think Herbalife grew their sales last quarter in the UK at? Let's, let's have a guess in the audience. Raise your hand. It's no risk of being wrong. Yes, 1%, one percent. okay. Someone else? 140 percent, that's interesting, okay. 20? 30 percent. The answer is sales grew 92 percent last quarter. And how is it possible that, I mean, maybe people are getting fat at an incredible rate here, I mean, <laughs> but, but absent that, um, the reason why it grew very quickly is they found a new immigrant population to go after. And this is a uh, product that where there is a boom as people get recruited, and then when very quickly, when the population gets saturated, saturated it collapses. Right now, they have, they have, you know, the UK business grew enormously and then collapsed, and now it's beginning to grow enormously. I don't, I, it's I maybe the Vietnamese population. Um, you know, I, was, I was with one of my investors and said, you know, I think the women who work cleaning the office are Herbalife distributors, and I met with them. And people are convinced to become Herbalife distributors that you have to buy $3,000 worth of inventory in order to start getting these royalties. And what it is is effectively an inventory loading uh, type scheme. So anyway, the, the very, so that's the, what the business is. Um, we did you know, probably uh, 18 months worth of work before we came public. We hired one of the best law firms in the country, Sullivan and Cromwell, to do, do their own independent evaluation. Um, if I'm going to say publicly a company's a pyramid scheme, I certainly would like the legal backing of one of the top law firms in the country. And both we and Sullivan concluded it was a pyramid scheme. And on December 20th, I made a public presentation. And there's a website called Facts About Herbalife. You can watch the presentation. There's lots of other data there. And so far, so good until Carl Icahn came along and bought 16% of the company, said it was totally wrong, and every, it seems like every day he goes on CNBC and says what a great company it is, and every time he says that, the stock goes up another couple of dollars. 
And in the meantime, the company's reporting very good financial results. But I'll make a prediction, and I don't know if I'm back here in a year. Maybe we'll it invite you back. back in, okay. <laughs> this business will be shut down. Okay, this business will collapse. I can't give you the precise date, but we will have made progress to that, uh, in that direction within 12 months. So that's my prediction for today. That's and the uh, profits will go to the Pershing Square Foundation, and maybe Peter will have some other idea for another Oxford program. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great segue. So, Bill, you know, you and Karen are kind of, you know, you signed the Gates Buffett Giving Pledge. Your family's made a substantial um, commitment to giving away your money. Um, we could talk about that in general terms, but let's make it more personal here. You were kind enough to fund these one plus one scholars. The whole point of these is, you know, people are going to study depth and breadth. Um, and then go off and change the world. 25 years from now, you'll be in your 70s, I think. I, I hate to admit that, yes. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> 72 to be exact. There you go. Um, so you're still young enough to be on the stage. 25 years from now, we have a stage full of one of Pershing Square graduate scholars. What will they have accomplished? What do you want these people that you're funding to have done in the world? So what's interesting is uh, there's an enormous leverage in people that, uh, in a single person, right? There, there are people that change the world. And a, a good example of that, uh, and I'll give an example of someone who might uh, go to the program someday, or in a, it's someone like this. So we were talking about Wendy Kopp earlier today. Wendy Kopp founded something called Teach for America. I was at the organizing meeting for Teach for America in 1990. A friend invited me to come. And she got a group of friends together, talked about the education system in America, about how you know, the best and brightest have not been going into teaching for a very long period of time how she wanted to change that, how she had an idea to solve the problem, and she wanted to start something called Teach America. Uh, it wasn't actually Teach for America back then, uh, until, until they decided to form this thing, and then, I don't know, six months in, someone else had the name Teach, for, Teach America, so they changed it to Teach for America. Uh, anyway, so Wendy Kopp has built a massive organization that uh, recruits, you know, I think something on an order of 10,000 uh, you know, kids right out of college uh, to go into teaching for a couple of years, typically in very difficult neighborhoods, and they teach math, and they teach science, and they teach you know, something related to their undergraduate degree. They get exposure to teaching. Uh, they meaningfully improve the teaching quality for um, you know, the schools they participate in. And a very high percentage, something like 65% of them, go on to careers, in, whether in teaching or in managing schools or in just the education field uh, generally. So if you think about the multiplier effect of what Wendy Kopp has achieved, I think it's been a very big thing for our country. And she's now doing something called Teach for All, and she's launching Teach for America in China and in other countries around the globe. So I think that's a great example of someone uh, that might, uh, you know, again, scaling a business like that, and that's a business, even though it's a not-for-profit business, is something that Wendy had no experience in whatsoever. And uh, she was fortunate in having good board members and directors and uh, t teaming up with the right people. But there are a lot of people that have incredible ideas on how to change the world but no experience and, you know, some of the people with the best ideas have the least amount of experience. And, you know, the idea behind, you know, an MBA program is to try to give you in a short period of time real world experience uh, that you can then apply. And so, so Wendy's a good example. Another example might be a guy that we uh, backed uh, named Andrew Yoon. And Andrew Yoon started something uh, called the One Acre Fund. And Andrew was in Kenya, I think, on a, a holiday. And he noticed all of these one-acre farmers who are basically women, uh, mothers, that uh, feed their family you know, nine, ten months out of the year based on the output of the one acre of land the government gives them. And then their family starves the other two to three months of the year because the crop output is, is uh, not sufficient to feed the family. And they use very primitive farming techniques, and they use very primitive seed technology and very primitive you know, fertilizer, and the result is a very uh, inadequate crop year after year. What Andrew said was, what if we could teach people better farming techniques, better irrigation techniques, get them access to better seeds that are more uh, viral, you know, virus resistant and so on. And he built an organization called the One Acre Fund. And he's now trained 130 or 40,000 of these one acre farmers. And, he, and he's actually built an organization that has a field, you know, it's got an organizational structure like a big company that's servicing these 130,000 farmers. He's grown it something in order of 50% compounded for the last five years, one of the fastest growing businesses. And it's, it's almost, it, it, he's self-financing, because what he does is he, so you take the initial output, your average output was whatever many bushels of corn, and he says, look, I, I will provide you with better seed technology, better fertilizer, better access to markets, uh, and you give me half of the increase in output 
as compensation for what I give you. And the farmers sign up for this deal. So they're able to reinvest the profits from these more profitable farms into helping more farmers. And we provided what amounts to a, work, a revolving working capital loan that he uses to, uh, to buy seeds and fertilizer. And then uh, he recovers the capital uh, when, you know, when the crop is done. Again, uh, brilliant idea um, and uh, growing at an enormously rapid rate. I've, he's got a shot for the Nobel Prize, I think. So that's another potential. Imagine what he could have accomplished with his Saeed Imagine. degree. Absolutely. And one, let me give you one more example, because not all of these are going to be not-for-profits. And uh, one quick thought on not-for-profits. I think not-for-profits are generally a worse way to approach a business problem than a for-profit. You know, if you think about the typical not-for-profit, it generally has people who are undercompensated. Uh, they, they don't uh, have a profit uh, motive, so it's actually in many cases it's difficult to define, su define success to judge the progress of the business. The boards of directors tend to be less attentive. They tend to be too big. They tend to not pay as much attention. There tend to be a lot of other companies in the same sector pursuing the same areas, but there's no M&A activity. So it's not a, you know, the, the typical not-for-profit is a dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional business. So uh, the way we approach things in the Pershing Square Foundation is we say, look, is there a for-profit solution to this problem? If so, we fund that one. Um, and only if there, we can't conceive of a not-for-profit solution and we think the uh, idea is a good one, the management is talented, and they're using business principles, will we back a not-for-profit? Um, but, so let just think of a for-profit example, and I, um, uh, someone who starts a um, company that can take uh, waste, uh, and there's a guy named Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen is an inventor, he invented the Segway. He's also invented a uh, device the size of a, ref a relatively small refrigerator that you can put any kind of fuel in, whether it's oil or natural gas or dung or uh, algae, and it will convert that algae into energy, so it will produce electricity, and it will produce heat. Um, and uh, his idea is basically uh, you take this uh, energy uh, little mini plant, you take a, you know, some solar panels, um, and you combine it with internet access uh, and a few other things that you might need in a, in a small little town. You put them in a shipping, you know, one of these containers, and you just drop it in sub-Saharan Africa, and it becomes, oh, and he also has a device that treats uh, the foulest water and converts it into fresh water. So you have energy, you have heat generation, and you have, uh, you know, solar, and then you have internet access plus clean water. And Dean Kamen, you know, the issue for Dean Kamen, he's a brilliant inventor. He hasn't figured out a business plan to get these devices introduced around the world. And the, actually, this, this device that converts the, uh, creates clean water, he made a deal with Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola is actually disseminating these uh, water treatment uh, little mini plants around Africa, just starting as we speak. And they are big red things. Uh, a lot healthier than the typical Coca-Cola drink, but I think their thesis is we start them on water, <laughs> then <laughs> eventually we're going to sell them Coca-Cola. Anyway. So you've given us lots of inspiration for what you all can do over the next 25 years. I'm going to ask one more question, and you should be thinking about the questions that you want to ask to Bill, um, because that's what comes next. I'm going to preference students first, um, and we'll you know, since we started a little bit late, we'll probably run over a few minutes. So, Bill, I would like to welcome you to the Oxford family. Uh, you know, this is not your home university. You'd spent a lot of time in Crimson, as I did. But I'd like you to think about this as your family. But this is not your real family. Um, so I know when I hosted you and your wife this summer, you were a doting parent, and your dad is sitting over there. So what influence has your family had, both your parents and your other family, your, your own family, on the person that you are and the work that you do. Uh, so let's start with dad, because he's in the room. Uh, so my dad told me that I should never, never work for anyone else, because they'll never pay me what I'm worth. <laughs> and then he tried to convince me to work for him. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked for my dad for two years, and then I went to business school and I didn't go back. And uh, he was upset about that, but ultimately, I think, um, so I'm, that was a bit of the inspiration for being an entrepreneur. Uh, and I was an entrepreneur as a kid, and I had my car waxing business, and I had my ditch digging business, and you learn about the relative metric measures of, of, of different businesses. You know, there's only so many di ditches you can dig yourself, and so on and so forth. So uh, I had a very early business education, which I think uh, was very helpful to me, and a lot of that I, I thank my dad for. Um, my mom, uh, 
you know, I describe myself as the most persistent person in America, but actually that belongs to my mother. And it's usually when she wants me to do something uh, that she behaves that way. But the, uh, my mom, uh, when I was probably 13 or years old, uh, she was very unhappy with the quality of the uh, rail service to our hometown. I lived in a suburb of New York City, and we had these old 1950s diesel locomotives that were always late uh, and literally had rusted holes in them. And, and uh, my father would never get home in time for dinner, and uh, the commute would take you know, a very long period of time. My mother was very frustrated by this. And she joined this sort of nascent but failing uh, uh, kind of grassroots organization to improve the rail service. And then she made it into something. And she ended up running a petition drive. She got, I don't know, 17,000 signatures, which is a lot for a petition, went to Albany, and ultimately uh, ended up getting something like a I don't know, $700 million grant to redo the entire uh, rail system into an electric uh, kind of modern day uh, system. And my mom ended up going on the board of the, you know, the MTA, which is the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority in, in New York City. And uh, you know, people wanted her to run for government and everything else, but she decided to stay uh, to, to, to raise her kids and be a mom. Um, but you know, I think it's a pretty inspirational thing for a kid to watch. And so I had to, from a lot of inspiration from mom, incredibly persistent, unbelievably competitive. I'm a tennis player, but my mom is the most competitive tennis player. Uh, so you learn competitiveness from mom, uh, entrepreneurship from dad. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, I'll, actually I'll tell you the most significant, uh, I think in the course of my life, what are the most significant moments? My dad won't remember this, um, but um, my, my dad's car, uh, the tire, it had a tire that uh, you know, lost its uh, inflation, and he asked me to change the tire, and he's standing right next to me. And our driveway was kind of like this. It was on a decline, and my, and my dad's like, well, you know, go change the tire. I said, Dad, I'm not going to change the tire with the car on a, on a, he said, no, 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 it's just a very slight slope. It's not a problem. I want you to go change the tire. I said, no, Dad, it's a really, I think it's a really dumb idea. Bill, I want you to do this right now. And I'm, I don't know, 14 years old. My dad tells me to do something. I got the jacket at the back. I jacked up the car. I start to undo the tire, start to remove it. And the car gradually collapses. Fortunately, I, I get out of the way just in time. I, I'm now, I'm alive. I didn't lose anything. Um, but it was a very significant moment in my life because even though he was my dad, um, you know, Ultimately, you have to make your own decisions. <laughs> and so that was a very significant moment for me. I, don't, I, I might have been 12. I don't remember when it was. But that was sort of the moment when you realize, OK, dad's fallible. OK, you can't, complete, can't completely rely on him. I'll give you one other. Uh, uh, I'm giving away all these familial secrets. Um, so I, let's leave it there. <laughs> to be continued. Um, so Bill, we thank you. But we'll thank you in a minute. Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions. Um, you won't get this many opportunities to get somebody of Bill's character here. And we're delighted he's spending this time here in Oxford. So um, there's mics. Uh, who are the people with the mics? There we go. Um, so since you were used as a prop in the, in the conversation. Even though she's not a student, by even the way. Though she, oh, well, OK. Um, please. Right, and there are preference for students, but since I call this person, you you always you can always say I'm a student of life. I'm not selling herbal life or anything. I we can't hear you. <laughs> My question is very quick. Um, I was wondering. A lot of critics say that um, activist investors sell companies and make a profit for the short term, and not really for the long term. What do you? What is your response to that? Sure. Well, first of all, I would say there are lots of different kinds of shareholder activists. Uh, but I think the ones that are successful, because um, again, we, we don't buy control of businesses. We buy a minority stake. And if you think about what an activist does, we buy eight or, we only bought 14% of Canadian Pacific. So you know, 86% of the shares are held by others. The only reason why we were able to get and have the influence we had is because the other shareholders backed us. And the other shareholders are big institutions that are not in it for the short term. They're you know, major uh, index funds and others who don't, aren't looking for a quick uh, three month profit. And they backed us because we have a track record of creating, of doing things to companies that create long-term value. And so we've made a lot of money in Canadian Pacific. Um, we've sold some of our stock simply because it went from being a, you know, 11 or 12% position to being a 28% position because of appreciation. But we've only sold stock because of portfolio management. And uh, you know, if you were to ask, all of the changes that have been made to the, the company's credit rating and uh, you know, has improved significantly. Or its or credit metrics improved significantly. The profitability has improved significantly. The company's made for the first time in its history, it has deals with all but one union, you know, five-year long-term contracts. The employees are happy. The railroad's functioning more effectively. Their customers are happy. You know, these are changes that are inured to the benefit of the company long-term. If an activist investor simply goes around buying a stake in a company and saying, you know, sell yourself, 
Um, I just think that's a distraction. Uh, and I think most businesses, you can create more value staying as public companies than you can by taking them private. I think businesses should only be taken private if they've reached the end of their strategic life, meaning that they've grown as far as they can grow and there's no more value that can be created as an independent company and then it should be combined with some other business. But if you think about what private equity does, they make changes to management, they make changes to strategy, cost structure, capital structure, all of these things are available in the public markets. In fact, I think it's a failure when a company sells itself to private equity. It means that the company itself, the management, the board, and its shareholders couldn't figure out how to create the value on their own. So I think good shareholder activism creates long-term value. Bad shareholder activism you know, pushes for short-term things that might create a bump in value but on the short term but destroy long-term value. Okay, great. So um, how about the person in the middle? Right, yes, you. Um, question, given your uh, relationship uh, when you worked with 3G Capital and Burger King, what was your initial reaction when 3G teamed up with Berkshire Hathaway to buy Heinz in February this year? Uh, my initial reaction was they're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> Just from the fact that there are 15 top line businesses that make over 100 million or from selling those off or more of... No, look, the, the way 3... If you, an interesting thing to do would be on a student trip, I don't know if you can make it all the way to Miami, but if you were to go to the Burger King headquarters um, and you get off on like the eighth floor, there's no reception desk. You get off the elevator and you walk straight out and the first desk, which is a desk you might see in a third grade classroom, you know, just a flat desk with four legs, uh, you could probably buy it at Kmart or something, is the CEO. And then about four paces uh, to his left, uh, is the CFO, and four paces to his right is the chief marketing officer, and literally the entire senior management team is in a completely open space, no offices. Behind his desk is a sheet of paper. It's got the five key things he needs to accomplish that year. It's got green, yellow, or red dots based on his relative progress. This is the CEO's progress, and each of the senior reports all around the office have their own metrics on things they need to achieve with commentary so that everyone can see them. Um, the printers are all set automatically to print on both sides. You're not allowed to print uh, color. They um, won't allow, they never allow presentations where the background is black and the letters are white because it consumes uh, too much ink and, and an ink cartridge. I mean, the, the, all the executives fly coach. Uh, they share rooms at, uh, you know, cheap hotels. Um, if you think about that kind of culture uh, compared to the typical big American corporation of private jets, and uh, really a lack of regard to expenses, they're just uh, gonna find, you know, I think the, if I remember, the company had, did something like $2 billion of operating income and had something like $9 billion worth of SG&A. My guess is that $9 billion number becomes seven in relative short order, and the two billion of, you know, uh, operating income becomes four billion of operating income. And they bought the company uh, with a, a lot of leverage. Uh, even though it was a junk bond issue, I think they borrowed money at 4% interest. So I think the, the total capital structure was something like 50% um, debt, which was at 4%. Uh, and Buffett put up this 9% uh, perpetual preferred stock. Uh, and then the equity uh, was only uh, about a third of the total capital structure. So when you buy a business like that with as much leverage as they did, and the leverage is long-term and on average very low cost and safe, you know, the, well, the 9% is a big coupon, if they can't afford to pay it, there's no penalty for them paying it. It just accumulates. And you apply uh, you know, a cost-driven uh, restructuring of the company, you're going to double and triple the value of that equity over time. So I think they're going to make a fortune. And since I'm friends with them, they very nicely allowed me to invest in the deal. <laughs> OK. Um, let's see. Um, maybe up a little bit further. Yeah, right by you, Victoria. Up there. Hi. Victoria. I have a question. During our times, who do you think is the greatest investor and why? Um, I think, I mean, I, I hate to be boring on this. I do think Buffett is the greatest investor. And the reason why I believe that is, um, you know, just the, the, this is a 50 odd year, it's a 60 year track record of compounding at 20 plus percent uh, with a very modest amount of leverage. Um, you know, in the form of principally insurance float. Uh, and I just don't think there's a record that compares. And I also think 
that what he does actually creates value for the world. Um, you know, I think George Soros is an incredible investor, but I think what he does as an investor creates no value for the world. Um, no, I think what he does as a philanthropist, I think is he creates a lot of value. Um, but uh, so I think Buffett has the benefit of, uh, I mean, I think Heinz will be a much better business by the time, you know, at, as a result of Buffett's ownership. You look at what he did with Geico since he bought it. Uh, I think he's been, uh, he's created enormous, he's bought businesses well, but not incredibly well as he's gotten to be quite large but he's made those businesses much more valuable. And I think he's also uh, created a lot of messaging that's affected the way people think about executive compensation and derivatives. Um, so I think he's made an enormous contribution. So I think it's a combination of long-term, you know, kind of longitudinal, you know, and the, um, and the accomplishments he's had. So I think he's the best, <coughs> by far the best. Okay, maybe two more questions. Um, well, I'm happy to do more. I can, well, I just. I, uh, I won't run out of energy, it's up to you. All right, so we're probably going to have to, because, um, so let's. Um, again, someone else wants the room. Yeah, someone else wants the room, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about this young man over here? Okay, I'll have a really hard question. What do you got? <laughs> huh? okay. uh, I'll try, I'll try. Um, you spoke about how dealing with failure uh, has defined you. Um, had you not failed, how do you think your decision processes uh, would have been compromised, and can there ever be long-term value in engineering failure? Okay, uh, hard question. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, I, I don't know that I've, um, you know, every day, you know, in, over the course of your existence, you make various mistakes, whether it's socially or whether it's in business, um, but the ones you really remember are kind of the bigger ones. So the J.C. Penney one, Certainly got a lot of, uh, you know, the, the problem with our strategy is we're very concentrated. We manage 11 or 12 billion of capital. So when we make a mistake, it's going to be really big, right? The numbers are, you know, we lost $500 million on JCPenney. Well, that was 4% of our capital. Now, that, that's, that sounds a little smaller, but that's not how the press is going to present it. But it's very, very helpful to have mistakes that you notice. Um, and so I wouldn't run, run around engineering mistakes. What I would do instead is, bear, bear, you know, is to uh, value them. Right? I think the natural tendency when you make a mistake is to try to forget it as quickly as possible. When the, uh, what you should do is the opposite. Uh, you should study it. And you know, business schools, you know, the case method is largely about that. Uh, a lot of cases are you know, what should you do in light of a failure or a mistake. Uh, and that's why it's, um, the best kind of mistakes are ones that you can practice with, other, you know, theoretically. Um, but the ones you really, really learn are the ones where you feel you know, something in your stomach. <laughs> or in your wallet, or some combination of the two. Well, look, I think one of the biggest mistakes our generation is making raising kids, I don't know how many people in the audience are at that stage yet, is um, you know, I think that an ability to deal with uh, stress, uh, you know, what people call grit, for example, is a bit lacking in our kids' generation because I think there's a bit of a tendency on the part of the parents to keep saving our kids when they're about to fall. Everything from the way playgrounds are designed, uh, you know, where if you fall, well, it's cushioned, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of an extreme example. I mean, you don't want daggers lying around on the ground, you know. Um, but the, um, I, I do think that we're cushioning a bit too much our kids and we should allow them, you know, my, my wife is a landscape architect and, uh, you know, some of the, the kids love the, pl there's a playground called the Adventure Playground in Central Park which would never get built today because the, you know, the litigation plaintiffs, you know, uh, probably have a field day with it, but, you know, the kids love it because it's, it's actually challenging. And so I think, I don't know about engineering uh, mistakes, but uh, I do think not saving your kid, you know, they're, they went into a class this year and they end up with their, they have no friends and they're, they hate their teachers. Well, you could move them to another school or you could do that but you know making them suck it up or they're on the you know the volleyball team and the coach never plays them um, you know do you go to the head of school and get them to fire the coach or do you say hey you know the life can be like that and you know you have to deal with it so I think that yeah I think that yeah. we need a little bit more Darwinism all right so all right one last question uh, Darwin was right by the way <laughs> was right um, the woman in red in the back. Uh, 
But this is a, I can tell this is a risk taker. This is the only person in red in the entire audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, I want to ask you, like as a hedge fund manager, uh, how, how, how do you define hedge fund in the most simplest term? And what's your opinion on insider trading? Okay, so uh, the, a hedge fund is actually, um, it's, a, it's really an incentive structure. So a hedge fund manager compared to an institutional manager is compensated largely based on the profits. So we get 20% of the profits uh, from managing uh, capital. Now, what a hedge fund manager does is very, very broad. It's everything from being an activist shareholder to being a commodity trader to being a macro trader to being a uh, short seller. Um, so it's, it's really a compensation structure as opposed to an asset class, and people sort of make that mistake. My thoughts on insider trading, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's very bad for the hedge fund industry to have a story every day in the newspaper about some hedge fund manager who's either accused of insider trading or has committed insider trading. I think that's an unfortunate thing. Um, and uh, there's some interesting debates as to whether there should be something uh, uh, you know, there are people who have made the argument that insider trading should be legal. In fact, that would increase the chances that security prices accurately reflected their value if uh, all the inside information was allowed to come into the market by, by participants. I think the problem with those kind of arguments is that if people believe the markets are unfair or a rigged game, then the, the, the largest source of capital in the markets, which is the retail investor, will basically step out of the market. And so I think the rules are generally the right rules. Uh, the problem I have with uh, a lot of the regulation, at least the way it works in the United States, is there's a lot of people who are accused of a crime where that uh, accusation is made in a very public way, it's leaked by a regulator, uh, et cetera, and that puts enormous pressure on the individual to settle um, and, uh, you know, or, and also harms them reputationally in their business and otherwise. And the government has enormous power versus any individual. And uh, I think that dynamic is a bit of a dangerous one. And I think all investigations should be private. Uh, and if ultimately someone's adjudicated to have committed a crime, then fine, it should be in the newspaper. But I think this notion of using the press, and again, I, I, I don't know Steve Cohen well at SEC Capital, but if you followed the press on SEC Capital, um, ultimately, with respect to Steve Cohen himself, there was never any evidence presented, at least publicly, that he was guilty of anything. But there was enormous pressure brought to bear on him uh, you know, to settle, and it destroyed his business, and uh, we'll never know, you know, it takes years to find out whether someone's guilty or not. So I think that whole dynamic is a very unfortunate one. Bill, thank you very much. Um, from convertible preferreds to parenting, from investing to philanthropy to what government should do, thank you for giving us a window into your life and your thinking, and thank you for making somebody out here, and some of us, uh, given the ability to change the world by being a scholar in the name of Pershing Square. Thank you so much, and uh, I can tell you, as a professor, um, to see your students succeed beyond all of your wildest expectations is probably the highest accomplishment that you know an educator can ever have. Everything so thank you for I know, I learned from Peter. <laughs> Excellent.